Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. This is a breakdown of last week's episode on Israel Keys. If you haven't listened to that episode, you may want to pause this one and go back and take a listen. Welcome to the CTN Breakdown. Tonight on the CTN Breakdown, we discuss Israel Keys Part 2, The Murders of Bill and Lorraine Courier. Welcome to our CTN Breakdown for Episode 2 of our four-part series into serial killer Israel Keys. Today we are deep diving into the disappearance and subsequent murders of Vermont couple Bill and Lorraine Courier, who would become victims of Israel Keys back in 2011. That was definitely a rough case to research, write, record, I think all of the above. I think it was probably one of our hardest episodes we've ever done. Uh, I know we've covered hard cases, but that one, I don't know why, that one really hit hard. I think it's, I don't know, I think it may be because just literally you can picture every step of the way. We, We live here, we know this area, we know where he was, all of that. We know the whole, you know, Essex is home to both of us. We both grew up there. So it's very hard not to, uh, it's very hard to separate yourself from the story, I, I think, on on that level, at least for myself. Oh, yeah, I agree. When we're talking about this or researching, I can just picture everything in my mind and it just, mm-hmm. it makes it that that much more eerie knowing that we used to live in this area. Um, I used to walk the same sidewalks all the time. Yeah, it's, same. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, all of my friends lived in that development and in that neighborhood. And we would all be – and I mean, we were always night owls. So we were up hanging out 2, 3 in the morning out there walking around those streets and that same development with – and we never thought twice about it. Never thought twice about it. And – it is scary to think how close that was, at, you know, and and heartbreaking for the couriers too, for their family, because it just it shouldn't have happened. If that makes sense, like things like that, you just feel like shouldn't happen in small town Vermont. It's pretty crazy. There's no other way to define it. Mm. Like you said, you had friends in that neighborhood. I used to live in that neighborhood. Right. One of my. Older close friends actually lived two doors down from the couriers. Yep. And you can actually see the courier's backyard from her backyard. Oh, yeah. So it's pretty wild because during 2011, June, that would be that would be my college – that would be my first year of college. So that would be my yeah. first summer at home. So I most likely was spending a lot of time at her house um, mm-hmm. because I believe they had a pool at that time. Mm-hmm. And even before that, when we were younger, we would always camp out in the backyard. So it's just really spooky to think that we were young. I I don't know. You're in high school. You're in middle school. It's kind of cool to camp out in the backyard. There's parents around, you know. We all did. And it's just really, really spooky to think that we were in the backyard that Israel Keys could have possibly walked through to get to the courier's home. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it. Like, your house even was pff, not very far from there. It was, like, what, a couple houses down? Yeah, it was It was pretty close. And, yeah. And, I mean, there used to be another friend I had that I used to sleep over their house um, when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And they were on that same, same strip as the couriers, too. So yeah. there's a lot of – I think that's why this case hit me so hard is because there's a lot of – roots mm. that I have to this neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, I Same. was riding my bike in this neighborhood. Yeah. My school, my bus for um, after school used to get off right on um, Colbert Street. Right. I used to walk by their house every day. So. I mean, I met your brother on that street, if, you know, it's it yeah. weird, but that's where we first met each other and became friends. So we just, we were all... It's hard to explain it, but it's a community. It's, uh, you know, everyone's so tight-knit. It's Vermont. Everybody knows everybody. It's like six degrees of separation. Somehow you're related or they're a friend of somebody, you know? And so it's just that kind of crime that happens. It's Our brains couldn't even wrap around it when it happened. Like, they really couldn't. The idea that a serial killer would come here and abduct a couple is just 
flooring. It is just flooring. And it is, it, everyone feels sadness for it. It, it hurt. It, he didn't just, you know, he didn't just abduct a couple, but he literally hurt a community too. This crime was on so many levels. It was obscene to the max of what he did. Everybody was so scared. I mean, mm-hmm. I have friends living in that neighborhood or that used to live there that their parents actually put up fences in the backyard because they I were so, them. so spooked out by Israel Keys being in that neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Because like we said before, not a lot of people had fences. You could see if you were standing at the top of the street Oh yeah. in someone's backyard, you could see all the way down until you hit a fence. Absolutely. And it's a dark neighborhood. That's the other thing to point out, too. I, I don't think it still is. It might be a little bit more illuminated than it was back then. But it's really dark on that street, all of those streets through that neighborhood. It's very dark. So late at night, I mean, anyone could be walking. It's the honest answer. Anyone could be walking on those streets and you wouldn't necessarily see anyone. Yeah. And actually, I went to visit a friend in that neighborhood and I can still say to this day, it is very dark still. Yeah. Um, the streetlights, I don't know if, if it's the bulbs or if the, if the streetlights are just so small, mm-hmm. but it is extremely dark in that neighborhood. Yeah, it is. Well, and the couriers had that, that giant tree in the front of their house. So, I mean, between that and – and it was set back just a little bit from the road. Not, not far at all, let's be real, but – Compared to some of the other houses on the street, it's a little bit further back. So yeah, if you wanted to do something nefarious like Israel did, it makes sense that he targeted that house because of its location, because of where it was on the street. And um, I actually remember in the the interrogations with Israel mm. Keys, he did mention that he actually had to stay up later than he anticipated yeah. because the neighbor – um, to the couriers was actually smoking cigarettes like every hour. Right. And I actually do remember that when I um, had a friend who lived on that street, there was a couple people actually, a, a couple houses where oh yeah, there would be people staying up late. They'd be up till like three in the morning and they'd go out and smoke some cigarettes yep. and they'd go back we in. Used to. So as quiet as that street was, there were a couple night owls that were up mm-hmm. up pretty late. Well, and it makes sense because that's a neighborhood that's pretty close to IBM. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of like night shift workers as well in that development. Yep. So that kind of tracks. And then, of course, a lot of teenagers were in that neighborhood too, like older teens. So it makes sense that, you know, maybe some of them were outside too. We used to be. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that much of a difference between when your brother and I graduated and were hanging out in there from when this tragic event happened so really wasn't that many years between it yeah because it's a pretty big neighborhood actually it is yeah now that i think about it so there are a lot of people coming in and out a lot Mm -hmm. of teenagers yeah a lot going on we were always all throughout those streets so i'm sure that hasn't changed at all probably still is happening that's what we at all would do it's vermont it's a little quiet cul-de-sac type neighborhood like you could go walk those streets and as long as you were quiet, no one was going to bother you. Cops weren't going to like ask you what you were doing or anything like that. So, Yeah, and to kind of paint a picture for our nerdlings, the courier's house was actually off of a main road. So it was a big neighborhood and there was – it was a pretty dense neighborhood – but the courier's house was actually very close to Susie Wilson Susie Wilson Road, which was a main street. Yeah, it's like, I guess, to put this into perspective. So the Handy Suites where Israel Keys was staying, that is literally right on Susie Wilson Road. It is right there smack dab on the right if you're coming in from like Burlington. Mm-hmm. So right after the Handy Suites, there's what's called the uh, Red Mall. And it's like just a little shopping plaza. It's not very big. And then right after that is the light, and on the right is where you would take to go to Colbert Street. So from Israel at Handy Suites, it's like a couple blocks. It's not even any significant distance at all to walk this. He literally just walked down the street and took a right and saw where it took him. Oh, gosh. I I bet you it probably only took him about 10 minutes to walk from Handy oh, Suites. Oh, if that. Yeah, not even. Like, it was that close. That close. Yeah. 
And I mean, this guy was a marathon runner. So for him, this was nothing. This is a avid outdoorsman. This is a guy who goes hiking. So walking down a street, that's nothing. And there's a sidewalk. It's right there. And the other thing to point out, it was late at night. Anytime after Vermont's quiet, after 10 p.m., streets get real quiet. I mean, let's be real. By 7 p.m., streets are pretty quiet. By 10, 11 o'clock at night, no one is walking. Like, there's no one around. So he kind of had free reign in a terrible, terrible way. Where he picked for his hotel or his motel, in this case, that location is so primed to everywhere he wanted to be that night. I think the, the barn was only a mile away. It's not far. It's literally up the street, so... Mm -hmm. Or at least in Vermont terms, up the street. Everyone's getting uh, Vermonter direction giving in this episode, but (laughs) it's what we're notorious for. On the left, that big sign, you know, it's all landmarks with us. But yeah, in this case, like, it really isn't far. So I still remember the – it's crazy because I do actually remember the night that – well, not the night, but the day that um, Israel must have started talking because I remember coming home from work – And I worked in Essex Junction at that time. Uh, My husband and I had an apartment probably a little further down on Center Road. And so uh, not very far, actually, scarily enough, from the barn. I think, what, maybe a mile? I don't even think it's a mile. Maybe half a mile. And um, yeah, so I was driving home and I remember seeing on the left, like traffic was kind of piling up in Essex, which is unusual. And I remember cresting the hill and being like, huh, it's kind of weird that there's so much traffic here. And then I remember looking on my left and seeing just police car after police car after police car in the um, – where the barn is in the driveway. And then seeing the mobile crime unit, mm-hmm. which up until that day, I never knew we even had a mobile like CSI unit. It was not something that was even remotely on my radar at all. And I just remember seeing that and being like, huh, that's really weird. And and you could definitely tell traffic was slowing down because people were all looking because seeing a mobile CSI unit and all of those cops in one area is not a norm here. That is definitely not a norm. So I just – I remember that to this day. It's been 10 years and I still have that so clearly in my head was cresting that hill and seeing it. And um, I'm sure many people do who were coming home that night. Yeah, and that farmhouse had been standing there forever. I remember oh God, always ever. passing that. I, as long as I could remember. And if you're looking at the farmhouse, and to your right, there's another farmhouse. Um, but there was a family that lived there. And I remember going to pick pumpkins at their pumpkin patch. And like that old farmhouse was always there. Mm-hmm. And it just breaks my heart to know that Lorraine ran out to the road and there were mm-hmm. it's not when you see that when you picture this area it's not in the middle of nowhere no this isn't like the woods or anything like that this is a main street it's a main street and if you were to stand at the farmhouse and look out to the road there is actually a house standing there that yep. people live in and at the time right down the hill literally right down the hill was the police station that was like a mile away yeah. from the barn not even i mean All I could think is if she had just been able to get down onto that road and screamed, maybe somebody would have heard her. Yeah. You know, that's like she came so close. Or if someone had just been coming home that night, you know, it just it kills you. It's the should have been and could have been. But that definitely is I, I, I think it's that moment, too, that I always come back to is just in my head is picturing that. It just makes me want to cry every time that just knowing how close she was to getting free and getting to that road and getting to, I mean, if she had just kept running, could she have gotten to the police station before he caught her? You know, if he hadn't come out at that moment and tackled her, could she have done it? Yeah, I think she could have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think she would have. Yeah. But it, oh, yeah. It's hard because like we were saying for us, we can just picture it all. Any of our Vermont listeners, you probably can too. That... This was very – I mean, people still talk about the crime to this day. You know, we'll tell people, oh, you know, we have a true crime podcast. And inevitably, the first question is, oh, are you guys going to cover the the case of the couriers? And we're like, yeah, eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had to work up to this one for sure. It was definitely one that you and I have – 
procrastinated a long time. Yeah. And like we said in the last episode, that farmhouse is actually, it's not there anymore, but no. it's kind of strange because there's still um, like two orange cones and- I don't know if it's caution tape or if my mind is just making it caution tape, but I know that there's there's two orange cone situations. They're not exactly cones. They're kind of like cylinders, but huh. they're out in front of where the farmhouse stood. And it's not- Really? Yeah, it's not on the driveway part because you can that. actually see if you go to the right of the driveway, there's still those orange huh. cylinders there. So I wonder- I. I've never noticed that. I'm going to have to look next time I go. Yeah, I, I've never noticed those. I'm wondering if that's just something they left up or if it's something to deter people from going in. Or... It might be to, to deter people. Yeah. That I'm sure they don't want. Understandably, they don't want people trekking through this. So definitely please don't go trekking through this area. Um, just out of respect, too. I, I will throw that disclaimer out, folks. Um, this is purely just for knowledge. Please don't go and invade people's privacy. Let's just not. Mm -hmm. That'll be my little my little reminder. But uh, wow, I didn't notice that. I I'll have to look next time I, I drive past there. It it's been a while since I've been to Essex, I think. Yeah, it's every time I'm in Essex, I I mean, I drive past that. So I always, mm -hmm. I always see that. And actually, I meant to mention it earlier, the apartment complex on Pearl Street is actually so lit up. There's so many lights in that yeah. parking lot. So I wonder if after this whole thing happened with Israel Keys putting mm. the courier's car there, if the owner of the apartment complex actually added lights to make the tenants feel more secure there. They definitely added more street lights throughout that area. Uh, I remember when it was even darker than that. Mm -hmm. Pearl Street in general is pretty dark. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised that they did. Because it they makes did. you wonder... If anybody saw him park their car that night. I mean, you could look right. If you were driving on that street and you happened to look left into that parking lot, you would have easily seen him. Mm -hmm. Easily. We're not talking about a secluded, blocked off parking lot. Like, this is pretty open. Yeah. That if you were driving on the road, you you would have seen him. Yeah. And you would have been seeing him grab out a shovel and... Just some weird paraphernalia, you know? Yeah. He would have stood out, so. And actually, Nat, that brings me to a question that I want to ask you. Oh. Since we're talking about Pearl Street and how open it was, mm -hmm. um, how close do you think the composite sketch was, in your opinion? Oh. Uh, I think the composite sketch, in retrospect, was pretty spot on. I, we, Ash and I were looking at it couple weeks ago when we were mm -hmm. first um, getting into this, I didn't even know there had been a composite sketch. So I found that really interesting. It was something I thought I knew this case so well. And then you get into it and you find these little tiny nuances of things that I never even knew. I did not realize that there had been a composite sketch. Uh, at some point, the police officers had thought there's no way this is matching because they weren't able to get any hits off that composite sketch. I mean – in their defense, they were looking for somebody local. Mm -hmm. No one was expecting a serial killer from Alaska to be hanging out here. Nobody. It was absolutely reasonable that they would, at that time, have been like, dismissed at me and thinking it was a mistake because they weren't getting hits. But in retrospect, if you look at that, and we'll post it on our social media, it looks eerily like Israel Keys. I, I, the person who saw Israel that day in the Courier Saturn – Nailed it. I And I know it was probably just a fleeting glance. Maybe they were stuck um, at five corners. That's the only thing I could think because, you know, you sit there at the lights for a little while. But that person definitely got a good look at Israel Keys that night. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I've i seen this sketch before. I just pulled it up right now and I'm looking at it currently. Mm -hmm. And they really – They nailed it. They really did get that sketch – down. I thought I mean, it was the nose. To the lines in his face, to mm -hmm. how far away his eyebrows are from his eyes. Yep. That's a big telling. Yeah, he had a really high forehead. Yep. They they really got it. They nailed it. And and the nose. He has a very distinct nose. And and that was for me the first thing I looked at. I was like, wow, that mm -hmm. really looks like once you know I guess it's the hindsight. What is it? Hindsight is twenty twenty. Um I probably butchered that saying. I always do. <laughs> but in retrospect, you know, that one was really they were Correct. That that was what he looked like. They, what's the word for it? They had identified the right person in the composite sketch. 
The unfortunate part was is that the Essex police were not looking for somebody from out of state. They were looking for somebody local because 90% – we cover crimes in the state of Vermont all the time. You all have heard them. Most of the suspects are local. It is absolutely reasonable that the Essex police would have thought the person would have been a local, especially because this isn't like a neighbor – you know, this is a very tight-knit, small community – The fact that Israel infiltrated it the way that he did and he knew these little places to go and hide and do what he wanted to do is a little unsettling because there are places that I wouldn't have even known to go. You know, like, for example, Mm -hmm. the Woodside Natural Area. I didn't even know that existed. I've lived here for 30 years, you know, (laughs) literally would never have known about that. Yet here's the stranger from Alaska coming in and knowing to go and hide a kill kit there. Or the fact that he figured out Pearl Street in the way that, you know, like, I think of that as something that, like, a visitor wouldn't know. Yeah. I I don't know if that makes sense. It's hard to explain it. But to me, in my head, it's like, oh, well, they wouldn't know these places. These are our places. These are Vermont places, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I actually did the trek on Google Earth. Oh, yeah. And I, we wanted to get Susie Wilson Road. So I started it from a gas station on Susie Wilson. Yeah which was close to the courier's home. And the Woodside Natural area was only 1.4 miles. So Mm. a four-minute drive and probably like a 28 to 30-minute walk. Right. So it was all such a close little triangle of area. He knew exactly what he wanted to do and how far he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing to point out too is that this was not Israel Keys' first time to Vermont. It was not his first time staying at that suite. It was not his first time here at all. He'd been here, I think he said, I think in the interrogation, he mentions four or five times. He's been here a lot. Yeah. So it sounds like he he probably came fairly frequently, um, whether it was for nefarious reasons or for fishing. He was an outdoorsman. Uh, his, it's on the way to his brother's house in Maine. So like Manchester is only a couple hours from here. So it's kind of like this big circle. So it it is on the way to his brother's home. So it, that makes sense. But it's almost like he came here so much. He became, you know, it's like when I go to see, we we go up to a camp in Maine every year. And at this point, like we've gone up so many times every year that you feel like you're part of it. You know, you feel like you know that area pretty well. I feel like that's how Israel was with Vermont. He'd come here enough to know it pretty well. He had a camp in upstate New York. That place is only, what, maybe two hours from here? Mm-hmm. Not even? Yeah. So he knew he was – I don't want to say the word local, but for somebody who was an out-of-stater, he was almost kind of a local. Yeah, and I believe I read he had gotten a three-day fishing license when he came up here. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And – That's what he seems to always do. Yeah, and if you go to the Woodside Natural Area, if you walk through the woods a bit, you can actually reach the Winooski River – and so yep. I kind of have a theory that um, he oh. went to go check on the kill kit, which he mm. buried in the Woodside Natural Area because right. the, the police actually found it. And he went to go fish, and that was kind of his his mm. thing. If somebody was like, hey, what are you doing? It's like, oh, oh I'm fishing I'm over fishing. here. You know, here's my license if you want to see. Here's my fishing No pool. one would have thought twice. Yeah. Yeah. Not in Vermont. No one would have even questioned him. I can't even tell you how many times during fishing season the summer what have you especially at the time when when they were abducted that's fishing season so no one would have thought twice about seeing some guy with fishing gear Mm -hmm. yep and um there's a little outlook park situation above the woodside natural area you can't really see the Mm -hmm. woodside natural area from the road so he had a pretty good coverage and Woodside Natural Area is 1.4 miles from Susie Wilson from that gas station. Handy Suites yeah. isn't that much farther away. So right he there. could have easily walked if he didn't want to bring his car. I personally think he walked. Yeah. I think that Israel is the type of person to have tried his damnedest to not attract any form of attention. And I think he would have walked. Purely my just my gut instinct on that mm-hmm. one. There's no evidence. We don't know. But – I think he's someone who likes to hide in the shadows. I think he's somebody who likes to kind of lurk. I don't see him just driving up kind of like normal. I see him going through the woods. It almost seems like it's part of the ritual for him, like part of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So I guess my question for you would be, do you think that – so Ash and I spent – we'll do a little prelude here. Ash and I spent days watching – interrogations of Israel Keys. Specifically, we hunted down. It's a little harder to find because the FBI has pulled a bunch of these, but we were able to find one from the interrogation where he admits about the murder of the couriers and he tells the story in his own words. It is rough. Uh, we will just say that. And we opted to not play any piece of it um, for the episode just because it is, yeah, it's rough. But he kind of goes through the whole thing of, of discussing that night and what the process was. And he makes it sound like he just happened across this barn that was abandoned. All of the instances that day, he kind of portrays it as like just pure chance that he found all of these things. So my question to you, Ash, is do you think that that is actually true? Do you think he was telling you the truth in those interrogations and what he told the FBI? Or do you think that – he was maybe leaving some important information out. Hmm. So what I've gathered from Israel so far is that he enjoys the thrill and the adrenaline. Yeah, for sure. So, oh, that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe he knew about the farmhouse. I do too. If he has been to Essex before, it's it's pretty noticeable. Yeah. So that I do think he knew about. I think he's driven by it before because mm -hmm. if you were to try to get into a serial killer's mind, like the horrible monster Israel Keys was, right. I feel like anywhere he goes that wasn't – because initially before Samantha, he said he wouldn't kill near his hometown right. or in Alaska. Right. So I feel like every state he went to, he was always looking mm -hmm. for a certain situation that he was like, oh, if I do this, then I can come here. Mm -hmm. And he had been to Vermont before. Yeah, he was comfortable here. I feel like he went, yeah. he tends to go back to places that he's comfortable, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like even with Deborah Feldman, for example, he abducts her from New Jersey, but takes her to New York. He's comfortable in New York. He's not comfortable in New Jersey. So he goes and takes her to Tupper Lake. To me, it seems like Israel goes to places he knows. It, it may not seem that way because of the convoluted travel he does. But at the end of the day, the places that he goes, he has some kind of connection to. New mm -hmm. England in general is really one giant state. Like, it's tiny up here. You could travel most of it in a day. You know, it's... We're not talking the size of Texas states here. We're talking fairly small communities. You come up here a couple summers, you know you know the area pretty well. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know. I'm with you on that. I definitely think that he probably had been here enough. I think – I would guess when he came in after he abducted Deborah Feldman, actually, he was in Vermont right after, the, a day or two later. So that was what it's assumed he buried the original kill kit that he would use to, to kill – Bill and Lorraine Courier with, I would suspect that he probably discovered the barn around then. That that barn has been abandoned a long time, as long as I can remember. Yeah. And to me, it kind of seems like you said before that Israel Keys was a walker. Mm -hmm. He'd walk around. He'd find locations. I mean, if, if you're new to a place, right. you go walk around, you know? So I, I do believe the couriers were random. You think they were random? I think they were random, but I do think... I mean, he, I think he said he was here. He had a three-day fishing license. He was mm -hmm. here for a couple days. He was here a couple days. I do believe since he's an outdoorsman, he probably mm -hmm. wanted to get out of the suite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, it's not like he's not going to stay in the suite for three days. Yeah, so I possibly think he could have walked the neighborhood beforehand and kind of mm -hmm. just scoped out what was going on. Mm -hmm. Because um, I do believe. He mentions that he tried to stay away from two-story homes, yep. homes with dogs, yep. homes that had – Potential security um, systems. Security. If there were kids there, he yep. wouldn't go in, as he says. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if he could get that all just by walking there in the dark. Right. That's exactly that what night. I was thinking. I would agree. I think he was there – Honestly, I do think the couriers were random, but I think he'd already picked that house out several days before, personally. I think that he'd watched it off and on mm -hmm. throughout the day. I don't think that he had just – he had watched it long enough to know that the couriers, one, were an older couple and that they didn't have children. He watched. 
I think also the other thing to point out is Israel Keys frequently lied in his like frequently lied in his interrogations. Mm -hmm. One minute he'd say one thing, the next minute he'd kind of skirt around it, or you know he'd tell half truths. He was very notorious for that. So this isn't somebody who's going to be honest with what he did that night by any stretch of the imagination. He was telling investigators exactly what he wanted to tell them and nothing more. Yeah. And if I were to just randomly be walking and see a pool in a backyard, Mm -hmm. I would personally assume there were kids there. Me too. 100%. And there was a pool in the back of the courier's yard. So The other thing too is, is how would Israel have known the full layout of that house? He had to have watched it. It just doesn't make sense to find. So for example, the side of the garage that he broke in through, the fan that he removed, it's on a darkened side of the house. He would have had to have been walking the perimeter of that house to have seen it. It's not something you would have seen from the yard or from the the road. At least I don't think you would have seen it. I I wouldn't have noticed it. So, but I mean, I'm also not a predator. So there's that. But to me, it just seems like he definitely, he watched that house for for a while. He walked that perimeter. He had already assessed. Mm -hmm. We know that the couriers were at work that day, right? Mm Mm-hmm. No one knows what he did that day. He had all day to be in that development. He picked their house because he he said it matched his requirements. It was a one-story ranch. He was a construction worker. He knew those types of houses. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly the layout. He knew that that house probably did not have – I'm going to guess he'd already looked through the house when they were at work or looked through the property to figure out where he was going to enter and to figure out if they had a security system or not because back then – it's usually pretty evident because the, you always have the stickers on the houses in the doors and stuff that say you have a security system. They probably didn't have that. So he would have had to have been pretty close to assess that. Yeah, because he did say that he had a headlamp. And mm-hmm. like I said earlier, he did say that the neighbor was often smoking cigarettes and stayed up late. Yeah. So I don't know about you, but if I see a- – I'm also like a nosy neighbor. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I'm a nosy neighbor. But if I see like a light flash and I'm up late, I'm like, what the heck? And I look out. Same. And and I'm not I'm not blaming the neighbors at all. I'm just saying that it's hard for me to think that he could get away with knowing where their bedroom was, knowing to cut the phone line, knowing all these things that one night. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think he. I personally think he scoped it out several times. I think that he already knew how he was going to enter. I think he already knew the layout. I personally don't think he used a headlamp because I don't think he would have drawn attention to himself. Or he did not turn that headlamp on until he got inside the house, which then he would not have known that there was no security on that house. He wouldn't have. He was taking a chance. Mm -hmm. To me, it doesn't make sense. Well, I guess he did say that apparently – as Israel Keys says, which right you can't again, take grain, of salt. grain of salt. He did say that if you cut a phone line, the security system would go off. Oh, but I that's do right. Know, Back then, yeah, they would have. I do know that when I was a scared college <laughs> college goer, and I had my first apartment, um, I did have those little alarm systems mm-hmm. that you could put, like you could put one on the wall that the door is attached to, and then put one on the door, and then when you open it, yeah. the magnetic kind of releases mm-hmm. and it, it sends off a little siren and that wouldn't be connected to the phone line. Nope. And we were just in the beginning of smartphone technology. And so I think, I feel like in 2011, this existed. But um, I remember that you had like, and then it's gotten more advanced now, but I feel like even back then you had it mm-hmm. where phones could actually, like the security system would actually go to the cell phone if you had a smartphone. Like obviously he didn't know if they had a smartphone or a flip phone. He didn't know what they had. Mm-hmm. So it's not – this is 2011. There are cell phones. People are using smartphones at this point. It's not – you know, it's not like it was in the 1990s. This is cell phone era. This is wireless era. So it's just weird to me that he made that assumption, you know? Yeah, and if I remember correctly, the old friend that I had that lived a few houses away from the couriers, Mm. they had a dog, and the dog was not a barker. And I mean, I totally understand. I have a dog and he does not bark. I have one that barks and one that does not. Yeah, I I love that he doesn't bark. But at the same time, I'm like, if someone breaks in, are you going to like, are you going to bark? My little dog is the one that will like eat somebody's or sound like she's she's a coward, but she sounds like she's going to eat somebody's face. Yeah. But my giant pit bull does not make a sound at all. Oh, yeah. Like 
my dog does not bark and he's also like a 60 pound pit. Yeah, the pit bulls are the ones that are like doo 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 doo. <laughs> but um if I remember correctly, they said that their dog was barking that night and their mm. dog usually never barked. And I'm surprised that didn't deter him. Yeah, and and if I remember correctly, the, um the dog was barking at something in the backyard. So mm. I kind of feel as though he kind of just scooted by real quick because, like I said, all the yeah. backyards were basically connected until you reached a fence. Yeah. And like we mentioned before, the neighborhood was really dark. So unless right. somebody had a porch light, that would pop on if it saw movement. But at the same time, my parents had those motion sensors and a gust of wind would set them off. So if that went off, I wouldn't really think much nah. of it. I could tell you literally ours goes off all the time because rabbits, whatever, set it off. And I've never in eight years ever gone to check what it is. I can honestly tell you. So I don't think most people would have looked. Not here, at least. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I definitely wouldn't. All right. So the million dollar question here is, is, do you believe that Israel's account of what went down that night was accurate? Do you think he was telling the truth to investigators when they asked him? Or... Do you think that, again, that he just kind of told half-truths or lied completely about everything that he did with the couriers that night? That's really tough because um, mm-hmm. we know he's he's a liar, but right. he's also a boaster. Yes, so, he, is, he is definitely um, narcissistic. Yeah, so I mean all we can go off of is Israel's account. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I do believe that most of it was what happened, Mm -hmm. especially because Israel brought up the fact that him and Bill were in the same unit in the military. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's something that investigators could easily look up. Right. And I mean, maybe he had that in the back of his mind. He's like, oh, I can really, really get them with, with this. They'll look it up and they'll realize. But I mean, at the same time, how would... How would he have picked that house and been like, oh, yeah, this is this guy was in the same unit as I was at some point? Right. Right. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think he figured it out because he was going through their stuff and had seen um, Bill's like medals, I think, um, mm. is how he figured it out. But he did that fast. I mean, he went through that house in like 15 minutes. I personally think he told the truth about most of that night. I do think that things when it comes to after, he got very vague when he was talking about the murder of Lorraine. He got very vague. He was much more descriptive. uh, And again, this was not – I wish I could get this out of my head. Uh, I do not recommend listening to the interrogations. Pretty awful. But um, he was pretty descriptive about what happened to Bill. He seemed a lot more vague about what happened to Lorraine. I mm-hmm. definitely picked up on that. He got very hedgy about I, – I don't know why, but for some reason it stuck with me. He got real hedgy when he was talking about Lorraine. So part of me thinks that more happened there than he says. And he did this kind of with Samantha too and in that interrogation that – I don't know. He got weird about some of the victims when he would talk about them. I, again, he only told investigators what he wanted to tell them. He He liked knowing that he had information that they needed – and they needed him to tell them. He had kind of that Bundy complex about it. Mm-hmm. And we know he looked up to Bundy, so I'm not surprised. I think he starts to lie. I think he starts to tell half-truths with Lorraine about what happened to her. And I think he lied about the bodies. Yeah. Afterwards, I definitely, definitely think that's when he starts lying about what he did after he murders them. Yeah, because, I mean, you and I have talked about mm. this Back and forth forever. Yeah. Yeah. So leading off of that, what do you think happened? Do you think the bodies were in the barn when it was demolished? Mm -mm. No. You know, I've come back and forth on that. And I've been pretty definitive on that since the beginning. I've never thought that those bodies were there long. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think Israel – there's two scenarios here that I, I see. Either Israel did leave Bill and Lorraine Courier in the barn and then left, but I don't think he just left for good. If that's the case, I think he would have come back a few weeks later 
and then taken the bodies with him or disposed of them. I don't think he would have left them. I just don't. That's too much. There's too much risk. And he was keeping, we know for a fact he was watching the case. He was tracking it the whole time. His computer history shows that. So to me, he knew they had no idea to look in the barn. He would have come back and gotten the the remains. He wasn't going to risk it. And so I personally think that he either did that or he took them that night and never – they were never left in the barn. And maybe there was just trace evidence from – obviously, the murder was brutal that there was more than likely a lot of evidence in that barn. So when it was demolished, the evidence would have gone with that. But I personally, I don't think they were in the barn. I also feel like the FBI did a – and the Vermont State Police and the all of the local police officers did a very thorough search. If you were here at the time, you would understand – why I say this, they did a very thorough search at that landfill. This was not, it's a Vermont landfill. We're not talking, you know, it, yes, there is definitely trash. It is definitely piles of trash for sure. But this is, if they can find bodies in landfills in like New York City, they should have been able to find bodies here. Yeah. And that's a super tough question too, because yeah. I just had an epiphany. There's a high school, probably. I don't know, a half mile to a mile away from the farmhouse. Oh, yeah. It's right across from the police station. Yeah. So, and I'm I'm assuming Israel knew that, seeing as he seems like he studied Essex. Yeah. And if I, I don't know, if there was an abandoned farmhouse, I mean, in high school, I never went there. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not something most high schoolers would go to, but I'm sure there are a handful that might. Yeah. There's definitely so, a handful that might. I'm kind of with you in saying – at first I wasn't. I wasn't with you in the beginning. No, you weren't. You were definitely like, nope, I don't think so. I think he t- – you know, I think they were left there. But I see you've you've come to my my way of thinking on this. I'm I'm excited. Actually, you make a really good point though with the high school thing. Yeah. I never thought about that. But yeah, I'm sure there were high school students who would have gone – it's teenagers. I'm sure there were teenagers who were going into that abandoned building. Yeah, like that's the typical like, oh, we see an abandoned building, like let's go in and yeah, well, like yeah. F shit up, you know? <laughs> like Yeah, and it's not like like we said, this is on a main street. It's not like it's you know, you could have walked through the woods to get there. You could walk up the street to get there. Yeah, and and also two thousand eleven Yeah. I'm pretty sure we were on the cusp of a big heroin. I mean, we've we've always oh, been. Oh, yeah. Actually, drug use has been yeah. pretty high in Vermont. Vermont, yeah. But I'm pretty sure around like 2011, 2010, we we're on the cusp of a really big mm-hmm. um, heroin abuse in our state. Right. So, and a lot of the times, people are going to abandoned buildings. Right. Yep. Absolutely. So, huh. I hadn't thought of that. I don't think Israel would have left bodies there because they probably would have been found. I also don't think it was common knowledge to know that that's an abandoned building is the honest answer because like I've grown up here most of my life at this point and I knew it was abandoned, but it wasn't like on my forefront that that's an abandoned building, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. I would never have known one way or the other. I would yeah. have assumed somebody owned it. You know, I don't know. It just seems like you would have to – like if I lived here and lived in town, I literally lived a mile from that place. Mm-hmm. I feel like that wasn't as common knowledge as people think. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, and and kind of going off on me not agreeing with Nat in the beginning, there were rumors that the mm. demolition crew that went to demolish the the farmhouse, they did say that they thought they smelled a dead deer. Mm. And I don't know about you, nerdlings, but I I'm in the woods a lot and. I mean, everybody hunts around here. Yeah. Also, if, if someone were to hit a deer while driving, Oof, oftentimes yeah, the deer kind of runs off. Yeah. Um, and if you've ever come across a dead deer, it is like it punches you in the face and you yeah. smell that from pretty far away. And there was actually like like we said, there were houses nearby. So mm-hmm. and it's kind of on a hill. Yeah. So I feel like the wind would kind of take a smell. Yeah, I agree. I feel like with two people in this situation, two remains, I feel like that would be pretty strong scent. I don't mm. know. That's just my my take on it. I feel like someone would have found them. Yeah. 
And he brutally murdered them. So yeah. it's possible that the smell was coming from what he didn't clean up after, if that makes sense, in a terrible way. Yeah. And Oof. trigger warning, he did mention Drano. Uh, he did mention garbage bags. But I feel like that could only hold up for so long. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm with Nat on this that I don't believe that Bill and Lorraine Courier's bodies were in the farmhouse. Mm-mm. I don't. I, and I know that the police have been very tight-lipped about anything since. I know they did find some piece of evidence that day when they did go and search the, the grounds um, the day that we were all seeing the, the crime unit there. But they've never released, as far as I know, they've never released what that evidence was. Mm-hmm. It's what led them to the landfill. So um, I'm not sure if they – just kind of did the the tracking of where the the house was put the debris from it but i don't believe they found an, a single piece of evidence from the murders when they went to the landfill and it's interesting because i've only ever heard of them having done the search once that one summer when israel was talking i've never heard about them going back again and they very well could have for sure but I, i'm not aware that they ever went back which seems a little strange to me too because I feel like all of these investigators would have returned knowing the location they wanted to to search and continued the search over time. I I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But Mm -hmm. I guess my assumption would be that if you thought someone's remains were there, wouldn't you keep going back there to see if you could find them? I don't know. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because like we've noticed in Samantha Koenig's case. Yeah. When – well, I mean, it was the one time – it might not be for all of his cases, but it seems once he commits a murder, he instantly flees that area. Yeah. And what we found in our research was that he went to New Hampshire after and actually burned, mm-hmm. if you remember, Israel packed a suitcase with their clothing, their yep. lingerie. Some jewelry. Jewelry. Yeah. And he burned most of that. Um, we did find some research saying that he kept a couple pieces of jewelry. Where did he put the gun? Remember he had the courier's gun? Didn't he drop it in New York, in a lake in New York? Yes. Yep, he did. So we know he came back through then. He would have had to come through Vermont Yep. on the way back from his brothers. Yep. Do you see where I'm getting at? Yeah, I do. I do see where you're getting at. So say he did leave him for a couple days, right? Went to his brothers for like a week. Uh, I don't know how long he was there. A couple days, I think. Came back through, he would have had to come back through to get to where he was going in New York. We know he then drops the gun on his way to New York. So he had the gun with him that whole time he went to his brother's and back. I mean, maybe he stopped at the barn house then and came back through. That's just a, again, this is all theoretical, but sorry, I just thought of that. Oh, no, yeah. And I was actually going to bring up the fact that Nat and I have been teetering on this whole 40 miles situation on the courier's car. Yeah, I forgot about the Yeah, the 40 miles. See, we did a lot of map questing in this. That's what we've done in this investigation. Yeah, and that's that's the big thing in our mm-hmm. minds is that 40 miles. Because we've done the whole mapping of the from the couriers to Handy Suites to Pearl Street, right. Woodside Natural Area. It is like three miles tops, not even to go all around. And back. And so that's the huge question because Mm -hmm. looking at a map, you can get to so many areas of Vermont. Mm -hmm. There's probably about eight towns just surrounding that are in a 15 mile range. Absolutely. And a lot of it is very rural and wooded, Mm -hmm. and some of it's farmland, Mm -hmm. some of it's lakes, some of it's rivers. Yep. I would agree. Like, there's so many spots. So, you know, one of the things that that Ash and I had found, um, we did some Googling, and an interesting piece that I want to point out is that, so the ferry to New York, specifically to upstate New York, there's two locations you can hop onto the ferry in the state of Vermont, or at least in this area of Vermont, I should say. There is the Grand Isle entrance, um, which is exactly 21 miles from the barn house in Essex to the Grand Isle ferry. and um, then, of course, you go on the ferry. The ferry, of course, you, your car is turned off, so you're not clocking any miles at that point. You go to New York 
or if it's late at night and you're on a ferry, that I think that ferry runs 24 hours, if I remember right. At least the Grand Isle one, I'm almost positive, is 24 hours. It runs very late at night. And it starts very early in the morning if it's not 24 hours. But um, yeah, so he could have gone easily across. If it's nighttime, you could absolutely put bodies in the water at night. And most people would probably not even have been around to notice. Just a thought. Mm-hmm. So that's one option. The other place he could have gone on is a fa- the ferry over in um, – Is it Charlotte? It is? I think it's in Charlotte. Yeah, it's Charlotte. Yeah. So there's a ferry in Charlotte, and that one is also 21 miles, I believe. Yeah, but that one isn't 24 hours. So the one from Grand Isle to Plattsburgh is every 15 minutes. I think you're right. It's 24 hours. I'm almost positive. Charlotte to Essex, New York is not, but Essex, New York is very rural. There's a lot of farms. Mm. And again, we don't know what time it would have been. It would have been early morning, so it would have been probably about six, five, six in the morning at this point in the timeline. So the ferry probably would have been running from Charlotte at that point in time too. Yeah. Yep. I believe it opens fairly early. I want to say it's five. Yeah. I kind of feel like the Charlotte to Essex, New York ferry is a better, Mm. not better option. I don't want to say that, but- I mean, if you're trying to stay under the radar, that that is the better option because the Grand Isle to Plattsburgh, you're just going right into a city. True. Yeah, you are going right into a city. More than likely, he probably, where he lived in New York too, he probably would have been going the the Essex. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that whole area, it's all farmland. And like, his house wasn't far from there. That's yes, more, that's yeah. closer to where his house would have been. So that makes more sense that he would have gotten on the Charlotte Ferry and got this is just all again all speculation but um it is very doable that he got on a ferry and went across to a different state like new york which we know from deborah feldman he's more comfortable doing and then coming back and that would be the the 40 miles 21 miles there 21 miles back also with ferries there is a parking lot so yep i mean this is kind of very out there but it could be the fact that Car was parked in Essex, New York, walked onto the ferry, Mm. because you can walk on the ferries. Oh, yeah, you um, can. Go over to Charlotte and either get a a cab, have somebody pick you up, uh, have another car, which, again, this is very unlikely, but it's just a way to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. I forgot you can walk on those, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because like we've said... As so far as we know, Samantha Koenig was the only one that he murdered in his home state. Or mm-hmm. not home state, but like, you know in, what I mean? In, his, yeah, where he in, lived. Uh, Deborah was from New Jersey, ended up in New York. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, Nat. Do you think that the couriers are in Vermont or do you think they're in another state? Um, oof, that's a question. I know the search for the couriers has been pretty extensive in the state of Vermont. I know that any remains that are found, I believe they're probably more than likely the first people that they are ruled in or out to belong to. Mm -hmm. So my instinct says that if they are in Vermont, they they are in a very rural area that hasn't been looked at. Um, They're either in the water. I kind of personally lean towards that he put them in the water. Just based off of what he did with Samantha Koenig, I I don't know. I keep coming back to water with with Israel Keys. I feel like he liked I, – I hate to say that an MO is kind of consistent, but Israel does have an MO. Like he very much does. Bill was the only person that he ever went outside of the typical MO of strangulation for. Typically, he strangled his victims. So he is a creature of habit. He definitely is a ritual guy. So I kind of think that that he, if we look at Samantha and how he put her remains in the water, in that lake, I, I kind of think he did the same thing with with Bill and Lorraine personally. Yeah, it's hard because Deborah Feldman isn't a confirmed murder. Mm-hmm. Uh, the investigators believe that Israel did murder her, but they don't have one hundred percent. He never confessed. Yeah, and it's hard because Israel said he buried Deborah. So Mm -hmm. from what we know so far, we have Samantha who was in water and then Mm -hmm. we possibly have Deborah who was buried. 
Right. But none of his victims, as far as we know, up until the couriers were ever left out in the open like the couriers were. Yeah. Yep. And that's that's the thing I'm trying to decipher because. Why them? Why? Why? Why change it up? You know? Yeah. So I actually believe that he buried the couriers. Oh, okay. So you think he buried. Yeah. And it's tough because, I mean, literally before we started recording, Nat and I were looking at a map of Vermont and there's a town called Nashville (laughs) that's 15 miles out of Essex that Mm. I had no idea about. And it's just, it's very possible he could have buried them in Vermont. I personally think my theory is that they're in New York. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of leaning more towards New York, too. But yeah, it just goes to show that, I mean, we've been locals, and I had no yeah. idea that that town was nope. was that close nope. to us. I didn't even know that town existed. And we know Israel liked to Google. He liked MapQuest a lot. He would always mm-hmm. be go- doing Google Maps to figure out things. That's how he knew about any of these places. So, I mean, and it's anyone's guess. I don't think they were in the barn. That's where I stand on it. I definitely don't think they were in the barn still. As far as I can tell, there hasn't really been much information released on what was found in the barn, what the state of the barn was at, none of that, because again, it was demolished. Mm -hmm. I don't know what investigators found when they got there that day, but I know that they didn't find anything in the landfill really. So to me, it makes more sense that more than likely he took the bodies somewhere and put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. I lean towards water. You lean towards burying. But I definitely think we're both in agreement that they weren't in the barn. Or if they were, it was very short, short short-lived. It was not for a long time. So, Nat, why do you think that out of the supposed 11 murders that Israel did, Mm -hmm. why do you think he told investigators about the couriers? Yeah, I keep coming back to that one. I don't know why he did. Because Mm -hmm. Israel was trying to curry favors. His big concern was that, and we'll get into this a little bit more in the the final episode, but his big concern was that he did not, it's weird, he didn't seem to want the press to discuss the cases or discuss his crimes. So I think in his own way, he was trying to exert control. And because, I don't know, because Honestly, he would never have been linked to the courier's disappearance at that point in time unless he had said something, unless he had evidence on his computer, which is what I think he did have. And I think they may have had actual physical evidence Mm -hmm. that he brought with him, whether it was trophies, the jewelry, things like that, that would have eventually linked him to the couriers. I think he was doing this as a way to negotiate, to try to say, hey, I'll tell you about them, but you're going to make me a deal. Mm Mm-hmm which it did work in his favor because he was able to do that. I think Vermont decided to not press charges on the state level. They were going to let it go federal Mm -hmm. because otherwise I think if they had – I'm not exactly sure, so don't quote me on this, but I assume it's because if it had gone on a state level, Vermont does not have the death penalty and Israel Keys wanted the death penalty. It would have had to have been charged federally for him to get that. Mm. That's my suspicions. I don't know if that's the actual answer or not. And if anyone knows, definitely let me know. I'm I'm curious on that. But mm-hmm. that was my assumption as to why. Yep. But I think he was negotiating. I think he was giving bits and pieces out because, one, he knew there was evidence and he knew that eventually it was going to come out. I don't know what that evidence was, but I, I do think there was some evidence out there. Whether it was found or not, we don't know. But I think he was using it to negotiate because he couldn't control – what newspapers were going to say, but he could control what information got out to them. Mm -hmm. And he was very, like, aware of – he did not want his daughter to hear anything about what exactly happened in those crimes. That was consistent, which is why I think he was getting cagey about what he did to a lot of the females in the crimes. I think that's where he was getting very shifty about it. I kind of have a different angle. Mm. So I do believe he was negotiating. But – Also, we know from the interrogations from Israel is that he was watching this case from the beginning. Oh, that's right. And I I, kind of feel like he knew that Vermont State Police had nothing and he he enjoyed that fact that he knew. Uh, Because you know how in his past he was like, oh, I love talking about serial killers because no one knew I was one. 
Right. So mm-hmm. you're thinking this is like purely the like gloating, I have something you don't know. Yeah. And I feel like that was like mm. a big adrenaline rush for him was the fact that the Vermont State Police and just investigators in general had absolutely no idea. That's a good point. What happened to the couriers? I mean, and he, yeah. And by doing so, he ends up with the power because he's got the carrot that they want. Yeah. And like we said, we don't know anything about the other victims of Israel Keys. Yeah. But he might not have been following up on them as much because it might not have been as heavily covered. Yeah. So that's my angle. I kind of feel like he said the couriers because he had been watching the news and following this whole investigation. Mm. It was very, it was a very high profile case if you lived in the state of Vermont. Mm-hmm. I don't think it got too much further than the state of Vermont, but it was heavily covered here. So. That kind of tracks. Actually, hmm, that's a good argument you've got there, Ash. I might have to I might have to be swayed. Yeah, I I don't know. I just after watching all these interrogations and just seeing how awful he was, I was like, I bet you <sighs> I bet you he was just glorified in this that he knew yeah. what happened to them, but no one else did. So he had to like share his secret. Yeah, I mean, I will definitely say I will be happy to never, ever, ever hear Israel Keyes' laugh again. It's ugh, just ugh, chill-inducing. This man is a monster, straight up. But yeah, I would agree. I think he was gloating. Now that you say that, I'm like, ugh, I think you're right. I think he always wanted people to see him as smarter than maybe. He was fairly intelligent. I, think, I believe he tested above average um, when he was tested, but... I think he wanted people to see him as something more. Even his, like, we'll get into it more, but his suicide note is very much like that. Like, see me as something more. See me as this. I want, you know, mm-hmm. he he almost has this, like, ugh, he's very narcissistic. So he has this narcissistic idea of who he is, this ego of his. Yeah, and you and I, Nat, we've talked about how his whole Ted Bundy fixation. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there were – people sending letters to Ted Bundy because they were right. he was accordingly so charismatic Ugh. and people just loved him and people are sending him letters in jail and it's Ugh, just insane. God. It's gross. But yeah, like mm, I'm sure Israel wanted that same kind of glorification. Exactly, yep. Yeah, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, that tracks. Oh, damn, yeah. that was a good argument. Yeah, all right, I'm swayed. And we'll go with you on that one. That, like we mentioned in the episode, what stuck out to me was Israel said he was going to abduct a gentleman mm. running into his apartment. And it stuck out to me that that gentleman had a yellow bug, which is what Ted Bundy had. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if that's what caught his attention. Yeah. So I don't know. That was kind of spooky, too. I, I noticed that and I was like, oof, I wonder... If it was just a random, yep. like he was like, oh, this is a situation where I could grab somebody and no one could see me. Mm-hmm. Or was it the fact that that person drove a yellow VW bug? Oof, gosh, man. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, this was probably, I would say this was the hardest case we've done. Yeah, yep. I'll fully admit that I was getting, I was having a hard time when we were recording mm-hmm. this one, trying not to um, cry. Yeah. Just. Yeah, it was pretty graphic. Well, we know this area and and we this is exactly why we wanted to talk about this being our hometown in the breakdown because we didn't want to take any mm-hmm. anything away from the couriers yeah. in the episode that we covered them in. And this is no way about us. We just wanted to kind of give you nerdlings an insight into the town that we're from and the fact that Nat and I I used to live in the neighborhood, Nat was there frequently all the time. So Yeah. And I think it's one of those things too that in Vermont when it's I don't know how to explain this, but like when one of ours comes up missing or one of ours ends up being hurt, it impacts everybody. I don't know if that makes sense. But like it's almost like a hive. Like we're very close knit Mm -hmm. communities. We're very we may not know each other, but we're Vermonters, you know? It's hard to explain that. So when somebody comes in and hurts another Vermonter or takes them away or or what have you, 
it really impacts the communities. It really, really does. I, I know we've talked about that kind of um, in our, some of the earlier episodes, especially the Vermont the Vermont episodes, but there is a sense of community here and, and oneness. And so the tragedy that happened to the couriers that night never should have happened. And I think it, it, it impacts everyone, their family, their friends, the people who knew them, people who didn't know them. Yeah, because usually in, in a small town, no matter how you you look at it, you have some sort of connection to this person. And yeah. I think that's what affects me so deeply is that I yeah. lived in this neighborhood. University, or actually it was, what was it, Fletcher Allen? Fletcher Allen back then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd go in there for certain checkups. You were in that building. Um, you, there's yeah. Obviously, there's still people around that knew the couriers because it was only 2011. So I'm sure no matter yeah. how you how you slice it, you will know somebody who knew the couriers. Yeah, right. And we actually do. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's one of those things that I think it's – people talk about – when they talk about Israel Keys, we, you know, we always talk about Samantha and we talk about what he did. But we don't always hear about the couriers. And I think it's really important to tell the courier's story because Lorraine and Bill fought so hard that night. I mean, I I get chills even just thinking about how much they fought and how much they loved each other and how much they tried to just stop what was going to happen. Like they really, really, really fought. And Israel Keys is a disgusting human being and good riddance that he's got, like, I'll say it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think of the couriers and I just think of, I wish that what happened didn't happen. But I also think about how brave they were. They were true. All of the victims of any serial, any victim is just brave. Mm -hmm. Like, we know that. But, you know, I think about the couriers specifically because I... I just keep coming back to Lorraine. Like, I can't even get it out of my head. Is Lorraine running out the door and and almost making it to the highway? Like, every time I think about that, I just want to cry. Because it's just like, yeah, she fought. I mean, she fought fucking hard. She fought really fucking hard. And it just breaks your heart that that they didn't didn't get to see the rest of the day. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. But... Yeah, this case is this case was rough. Um and the next one's just as rough. So uh yeah, Israel Keys kind of just is a piece of trash. Yeah. Yep. And uh I just we'll, we'll we're going to talk about it later in in the last episode. <laughs> I have to hold myself back, but um yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> uh it sucks. He took the cowardly way out. He didn't he didn't. Oh yeah, he didn't own any of his. Yeah, didn't no. own up to anything. Well, I mean, we did get the confession for the couriers, which is. But even in the interrogation, he was just so blasé about them not finding the remains. Like he was laughing, like, "Oh, you didn't? They didn't find it? Oh, that's interesting." Yeah. Like, how do you? These are people. How do you so? You know, yeah. like yep. it's rage inducing to listen to this man. Like it is rage inducing. Mm-hmm. I think I've yelled at the TV more in the last month watching these interrogations than I ever have before. But yeah, like I, I, these are people and this man is just like, oh, well, they didn't find him. Oh, you know, like like he's talking about the weather. So mm-hmm. I genuinely do not enjoy serial killer cases. It's not my norm. I, I tend to prefer like unsolved or cold cases or giant and John Doe cases. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, at the same time, too, I think it's important to cover these once in a while. Bill and Lorraine Courier. They mattered. They belonged to people. There were people who loved them so dearly. There was a community who loved them so dearly. Same for Samantha Koenig. Same for Deborah Feldman. You know, anyone who's been a victim, people loved you. People loved them. They mattered. Mm -hmm. And with that, nerdlings, we close this chapter of Israel Keys Part 2, The Murders of